20th century, the Constitution of India and ensured adult franchise for all. I watch a video of women cycling in short dresses talking of how not to flash. They wide angle their legs, pull the back of their skirts, and with a coin and a rubber band marry it to the front of their skirts. It becomes a pant. I think of their legs in the sun, delicately agile on swerving bicycles. In the country where I live, clothes that show leg, armpit, curve of breast, invite brutality, not postcard beauty. Veils, perders, stoles, depatters and leggings are needed to cover up. Short skirts are not about fashion or suiting body types. They're about freedom. One day we'll get there. Cycling in the sun on slippery rain kiss paths where smaller solutions will be our search, the larger ones done. We'll divide the skirt into a pant. Maybe not even. The women in the video talk back. They smile their gorgeous smiles. Yes, we wear skirts. We even show our thighs, they say. But freedom is relative like time, like poverty. We might not get killed, but don't ever think nothing else happens to us. Did you know of the woman who walked 10 hours as a social experiment through New York and received 108 vile propositions? Your culture compels you to hide, not show. We want that, so we don't have to be dull sexy all the time to prove our beauty our femininity. Our thighs can be our anatomy, we. If we wrap ourselves in yards and yards of fabric, like in your country, we're looked at as regressed, unsexy. The women in the video and I turn to you. Why should the world be telling us what is less, what is more? How we should wear what we wear in this tug of fabric, fabric of war, five centimetres or nine yards, head naked or covered up, waist seen or shown? Why is the world telling us what to wear all the time? Why is this our most silent daily question? What to wear? And is it for ourselves or for someone else we ask this? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 12th Z Jaipur Literature Festival, and we are right here at Darbar Hall. Rainbow Readings.
please welcome our panelists, Chiki, Frankie, Erozan, Madhavi Menon, Sandeep Roy, Tova Reich, in conversation with Arpita Das. So this is exact, is this working? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. God, happy Republic Day. What better way to celebrate Republic Day this year than with this fabulous panel, right? Let me hear a cheer if you agree with me. Yep. So, um, this is of course a great honor for me. I work with a publishing house that has had a dedicated LGBT list, as some of you might know, for the last 15 years. And this is an absolute honor, this opportunity to engage these fabulous writers um, about their work. Um, and I'm going to give you some quick, but hopefully substantial introductions to each one of them. I'm going to start with Chike Franke Adosian who is a Nigerian-American writer. He's a whole lot of fun, by the way. Um, he's also a journalist. He works for the New York Post. He also teaches at NYU. Um, his memoirs, which is what we'll be discussing today, The Lives of Great Men, Living and Loving as an African Gay Man, won a Lambda Literary Award last year. And it was described as one of the most expressive and emotionally satisfying memoirs of recent years. Yeah? Okay, so moving on to Tova Reich, who, whom I've been getting to know for the last few weeks since the Kerala Lit Fest where we met, is an award-winning author of several novels and short stories. Two of her novels have these fabulous titles, I thought. One is called My Holocaust, and the other, wait for it, is called 100 Philistine Foreskins. We like that, don't we? Uh, today, though, we'll be discussing her latest book, Mother India. Um, next to her is Sandeep Roy, one of my favoritest columnists. Is favoritist a word? Doesn't matter. My 14-year-old says it is. So, uh, columnists in India. He, uh, his columns appear regularly for the Economic Times, for the Hindu, for GQ. Um, and his book, Don't Let Him Know, apart from making us all weep and lose sleep, um, was longlisted for the DSC Prize, has also won other awards, and he has contributed many stories and essays Sandeep has to a number of anthologies, and I'm happy to say that one of them was Because I Have a Voice, which was one of Yoda Press's first books, which is the little publishing house I run. So serendipitous connections here. Madhavi Menon, last but certainly not the least, um, is my, well actually she's permanent faculty at Ashoka University and I'm adjunct faculty, that makes me a notch below, but I'm thrilled to have a fellow person from Ashoka University, there's some students here as well, she works, she teaches in the Department of English Literature there, she is, she writes on queer theory and she is here to discuss um, a fabulous, fabulous book that has created controversy, but also made us think a lot, called Infinite Variety, which looks at the entire complex landscape of desire in India, right? Introductions done, now let's get started with some questions. Right, now who do I begin with? They're all fabulous and they all look so good. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go with Frankie because it's his first time in India. Um, Tova's been here for a bit, so I think let's do this with Frankie first, yeah? I'm ready. Um, Frankie, Hi. Um, we've been talking a bit over the last few uh, conversations about um, the Nigerian gay man in the diaspora. And of course, he figures in a big way in your memoir. Your memoir for me was, was important because it bears witness to a community which is trying to make its voice being, uh, be heard against great adversity. Tell us something of that experience. So for me, it was very, very important um, to document not just my life, but the life of my friends, um, my, my neighbors, other people who are identified as LGBTQIA, 
but are forced under the brute force of culture and the state, you know, um, to hide themselves, to find pockets of community for them. I found it really, really tragic that anybody that I knew, whether they were extremely well-educated and very accomplished um, and had lots of degrees and were very successful, or they didn't even have formal education and they were just working as tailors or miners, they had the same problem. They all had to be in loveless marriages. They all had to fulfill all righteousness by getting married and having children, and then find a way to find love and companionship behind closed doors. It is not, um, it's not a situation that I would wish for anyone, but what that does, living in secret and living in hiding, is that it allows people who are in charge of policy to say that you don't exist. Or that if you do, there's just one or two of you anyway, so why do we need to decriminalize? Why do we need to have equality? And in 2014, when the former president of my country, Goodluck Jonathan, pushed the most draconian anti-gay bill we've ever seen, where people could be arrested just for holding hands, for having meetings, you could be arrested for not turning in your gay kid, a lot of the press coverage from that era simply said 99% of the population was in support. And there were no voices to counteract that. And that was the moment I thought, you need to stop dilly-dallying with these stories and writing them piecemeal for magazines. You need to put them out front and center in a book that people can go and pick up, lawmakers can pick up, anyone can pick up, and see that there is so much more variety in our respective countries, whether it's Ghana, where I work a lot, or it's Nigeria, or it's Botswana, or it's Uganda, there are all of these stories that had never before been told in a public space. And I think that is why the book resonates with so many people, because the most important thing that I've heard was that we are now seeing ourselves in literature, not as caricature, for the first time. And so that makes me feel like there will be a floodgate of more stories if we have an ecosystem where everyone can tell their own stories. Literature, not as caricature, and the, that's tweetable, guys, tweetworthy. Uh, <laughs> Frankie, I, uh, you've earned yourself this label that you've written the first gay memoir coming out of Africa. Well, definitely out of West Africa. How, was it, how has it been received there? So, I... I um, I actually did not realize that it was the first one. What I knew was that when I was trying to find other work that I could reference, I couldn't find them. And I simply thought at the time that perhaps I wasn't that as good a researcher as I thought I was. Um, and then when I found out that, well, they had actually every other reference to people in my part of the world who are non-heterosexual um, was in fiction. There is no non-fiction narratives of us with our three-dimensional lives. One of the things that I thought would be difficult would be launching the book in Nigeria, launching the book in South Africa, launching the book in Ghana, and I have had events, and the most that has happened is that there have been too many people for me to talk to. And what they are saying is, I may not agree with you, or I love you and I agree with you, but it is high time that we found some real people in our literature, rather than the jokes that we have in the newspapers. And so I've been to Nigeria twice with Lives of Great Men. I've had a lunch in South Africa. I'm going to have a lunch in Ghana. And for the most part, people around Sub-Saharan Africa have found the book through Kindle or through friends. And the response has been overwhelming. Just to say that there is an opportunity for us to talk about ourselves without being ashamed of who we are. Are you going to read us a little bit from the book? Okay. <laughs> so we're going to have a lot of readings because they are writers and we should have more readings of uh, writers' books rather than people prattling on, is my theory. So just as a preface, I'm going to talk about um, somebody that I knew who was a contemporary of mine um, and then reconnected with this person 10 years later, or a little bit over 10 years later, but um, our lives have gone in totally different directions. We were um, teenage sweethearts before I, I left Nigeria, and I returned to Nigeria to find us um, still interested in each other, but with very different lives. 
I open my eyes, but I'm not moving. This siesta has probably lasted 20 minutes, and now I'm staring at the lanky, striking man awakening beside me. It's mid-afternoon, and outside, the streets are choked with crawling vehicles. Over the past few days, the ubiquitous horn blaring has been getting on my nerves. When did Ikoi become so noisy? At least, it's serene here in the Moor House. The air conditioner is humming softly, chilling the room. The severe brown wood paneling decor is masculine, nothing soft about the furnishings. This small boutique hotel may be tailored for busy business people, but it's an oasis amidst the chaos of Lagos. And it's in this oasis that I am reconnecting with my childhood love. I stretch and see our naked selves in the mirror, legs intertwined on crisp white sheets. All afternoon, we've been canoodling, then having furtive, furious sex. It's been 10 years plus since we last met. Even after all this time, our bodies haven't lost that feral magnetism for each other. At first, we try to tamp down the sexual tension by staying out with others at the bustling Echo Hotel. But in the end, we just gave in. He stares, spurring me to inch closer, put my arms around his waist and peer over his shoulder. He smiles and I melt. You do okay? He asks. Years ago, whenever we were alone, his deep voice softening to a whisper made me feel loved. And it does today. He still has dimples and the whites of his eyes still shine against his granite colored skin. He has no tribal marks, but turns to see if mine remains. Few notice it. It is tiny and hidden like a small scar under my right eye. He finds it, smiles, and strokes it with his thumb, then kicks off the sheet. As my full any lover's sinewy naked body stretches out into the exposition, I touch his throat gently, marveling at how thick and soft it still is. What sort of pomade is he using now? I gaze at this body that's remained taut, even though it's now without the chisel of yesteryear. You look great, I say, gently fingering his belly button. His stomach tenses. I no be fine boy again, no, he replies. Your hair still plenty. He always appreciated the hair that sprouts abundantly over me. I shave my head and face, but I love my hairy chest, legs, arms, and rarely trim or manscape. I'm happy it still trips thrills him, but I feel trapped. Even his scent, a mix of cigarette smoke and musky cologne, holds me captive. I hug him tighter. That Diana Ross ditty floats in and out of my consciousness. Touch me in the morning, then just walk away. We don't have tomorrow, but we had yesterday. What am I doing? I've just spent hours having sex with somebody else's husband, and now we're in a post coital afterglow with little to say. I remember him always talking, even after sex, but today he just smiles. We look into each other's eyes. We both want to be here. Guilt isn't part of the equation. With this man, it never has been, not when I was 19, and not now when we are both in our 30s. Nothing's changed, yet somehow today, everything is different. Tova, I'll move to you next. Um, you, when I read that book, I said, this is the lesbian Shantaram. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, it has so many sensational twists and turns, and you get into a lot of trouble for your writing, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. Um, not deliberately. I don't realize that it is in any way transgressive while I'm working then it suddenly, somebody tells me. But um, in general, uh, yes, I've always gotten into a lot of trouble for my writing. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Some people call me an equal opportunity offender. So uh, my new book, Mother India, has things to say about, uh, it's a story of Jews who come to India, three, three women from the same family who come for different reasons to India 
and it talks about Jews, and it talks about Indians, and it doesn't favor anybody, and it favors everybody. I mean, just in, the, in their humanity, but it's uh, basically a story that gets me into trouble, or will probably get me into trouble. I've gotten into very deep trouble with my Holocaust, which um, the title itself got me into trouble, but the, the novel, which is the most satiric and straight out satiric of my, all my novels, is basically not about the Holocaust. It certainly doesn't deal with the event itself, the Holocaust or what I call the Shoah, which is kind of defeats memory. You can't really write about events like this because they, they transcend memory. They, they, just, they, just, they transcend fiction. You can't make it up. But it talks about Holocaust memory and its abuses and how uh, Jews have used the Holocaust for various things in order to advance themselves either financially or have used it to advance themselves, their reputations, and also how others who are not Jews have seen the advantages of having a Holocaust of their own uh, or, or, a piece of, or a piece of somebody else's Holocaust and kind of... Um, and the story and the novel is basically a very intense kind of swifty and uh, satire. So yes, I've gotten into serious trouble on that one. I was wondering when we were talking earlier that you, are, you were on one panel uh, which is on the Jewish novel and you're on this panel which is on rainbow right. readings. And um, do you find yourself slotted, categorized yes, very often? Yes, uh, obviously I'm slotted in Jaipur and they could have put me on a panel on women novelists and they could have put me up on a panel on feminist novelists and they could have put me on a panel on... Novelist. Novelist, Just novelist, novelist right. A writer. <laughs> and they could have put me on a panel on satirists. So I'm obviously being labeled and it's the simplest thing and it's uh, clearly a simplification. Uh, I certainly don't see myself that way. I don't see my work that way at all. And, um, uh, you know, I see my work as talking about human beings from a kind of um, uh, a tragic perspective that I, that I somehow in my writing uh, see the absurdity of, really the sad absurdity of. And uh, I, you know... I don't mind what people call me. I call them things too, so. <laughs> um, one of the things, and you're getting a taste of that, one of the very important sort of uh, ingredients of Tova's uh, writerly arsenal is very sharp wit, wit and satire. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons you keep getting into trouble. Well, satire gets people into trouble. Uh, I, um, it's a mode I've developed, you know, as I taught myself how to be a writer, because I think that event, um, essentially my vision of, um, my vision is tragic, very dark, and to sort of um, succumb, surrender to that vision and to articulate it on the page would be basically a soup, it would be a mess, it would be sentimental, it could be sentimental, uh, you just can't deal with it. I think, uh, I think a big influence for me has been Gogol. Uh, maybe I would, I would cite his, uh, the story of a madman as one of the influences in which it's really a crazy story in which this guy really goes off on a limb and uh, it's a satire on mental institutions and satire on on self-perception, but in the end, uh, the, the, the tragic depth is revealed with the cry for his mother, and then he lapses back into his extreme nuttiness. But yeah, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the way I approach my material. Are you going to give us a taste of the most cutting part of your book? Oh, well, one of the many, many cutting, funny parts of your book. The funny but bits, but not the sad ones. I can't handle that right now. You, you want me to read you a funny bit? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, I, I chose a bit partly because it's short and we have, I would like to hear the other panelists read uh, much more than hear myself read. And um, 
just, just to give you a little bit background so that you could catch the nuances here, the novel is the story of, as I told you, three women. The, uh, there is the character Ma, who is a woman in her 80s, a, a, a deeply orthodox Jewish woman who comes, who sudden, dying of cancer, who suddenly decides to go to Varanasi and die there because she read that it is the only uh, road to liberation. And the narrator of the novel is her daughter Mina, and Mina is the character. And Mina is trying to explain how this religious woman, this deeply religious woman, identifiable to many people. I'm sure you, Frankie, have seen these guys around and would be able to identify them in New York. Um, how such a person even got the idea to go to India, and it turns out that Mina herself was a rebel to this rabbinic household. Uh, you know, rebel in an adolescent kind of way, and then later on she had a relationship with the man basically in order to marry him and get out of the house. That was the only way out, uh, from which she had a child. And then she went to India, became kind of a, a tour group operator, uh, bringing well, wealthy women to ashrams and Ayurveda clinics from well-endowed women. And she meets a gorgeous woman in, uh, actually on the night of the terrorist attack on Mumbai. I told you, lesbian Shantaram. <laughs> that, yeah, I guess once you're in Mumbai and at the Leopold, you're in Shantaram territory. But uh, anyway, uh, this woman is called Gita. She's a very complex, wealthy, beautiful princess. And the two of them decide to get married. They're gonna have, in Brooklyn, they're gonna have a Jewish wedding. In India, the, in, in the Taj, in Mumbai, they're gonna have an Indian wedding, which is quite similar in their ways. And the scene that I'm going to read to you is when Mina is trying to convince her father, the rabbi, that he should make the wedding for her in the Jewish tradition in which the parents make the wedding for the girl. So. Uh, it starts with a reference to, uh, she's trying to say, I'm not telling you about myself. I don't want to talk about myself. I want to explain to you how uh, my mother even got this very strange India idea. So that's how it's going to begin. With regard to my mother, though, the main point is that thanks to me, not only India, but also the possibility of rebellion was not so far into her not in the heavens, but on the near horizon, close at hand. Ma had me as a model, my lifelong career as a free radical, its early onset in my adolescent acting out, black hair wild to the waist, diamond stud in the cleft of my nostrils, lotus tattoo like a locket at the base of my throat, the full original presentation of my identity politics. And these were just some of the external manifestations that she and my father, the rabbi, and the entire neighborhood and the whole congregation of Israel could actually witness and testify to. He pretended as much as possible to be oblivious to all of it, my father, the rabbi. That was his defensive stance. He wouldn't see it, so it wasn't there. Like God who is invisible, I challenged him. He also dismissed my fixation with India, refusing to take it seriously. Seriously, any religion reputed to be nonviolent, however mistakenly, such as Hinduism or Buddhism, not major players, nothing that required emergency excision, certainly not in the same league as a religion with muscle, a hardcore apostasy like converting to Christianity, God forbid, so when I brought Gita to them as my true intended, my destined one, my Baisheta, he at first made a big provincial joke out of it, claiming Gita was one of ours, insisting that she was really just a ni another nice Jewish girl, a Murano, a member of the lost tribe of Menashe. She looked like such a proper Yiddish medala, and wasn't her name Gita after all? Such a respectable Yiddish name, Gittel, it means good. He had an aunt named Gittel, Tante Gitteler, murdered in the gas chambers by the Nazi killers. May their name and memory be blotted out from the face of the earth. But I would not back down. I refused to allow him to patronize my reality and the reality of my bride. Sorry, Pop. No way Gita is Jewish. G 
Gita is purebred Indian, 100% top caste. It was then that my father spat out into our shared space the word Indic, which means not only Indian in Yiddish, but also Turkey. Good, at least he's mad now, I thought. At least it has registered finally that I'm not kidding around. Hallelujah, I cried, and digging even deeper into the Praise God Book of Psalms for further ammunition, I added jubilantly, Hodu Lashem Kitov, give thanks to God for he is good, because Hodu means not only Thanksgiving, it also is Hebrew for India. Therefore, as I pointed out to my father, the rabbi, the scholar, but no gentleman, what for a gentleman, it can only be interpreted as India is to God, for it is good. And within the godly goodness of India, I embraced my divine Gita, my wife. The old man barked out a sharp little laugh, rejecting the seriousness of this new development as well. Such relations between women were meaningless. The Torah does not even condescend to mention them for the sake of forbidding them because they produce nothing, they're ridiculous. The mechanics were beyond his imagination. Still, I would not let him dismiss me. I insisted on due deference to my choice, a full-scale wedding, never mind that I was already an independent operator and at an advanced stage. It was a father's responsibility to give his daughter a proper wedding, not like the slap together under the radar shotgun affair that had made it official between me and my first husband. This time I was going to collect all the celebratory shards of broken plates and glasses I deserved, the dancing chairs, the complete smorgasbord, including the ice sculpture in the shape of a swan, every last clarum of daughterly entitlement. So, you want a Jewish wedding? Ma remarked after prolonged thoughtful pause when I was done with the pitch. No, so okay, but just in case you don't happen to know this, the custom is the bride's family pays for everything except flops, F-L-O-P-S, flowers, liquor, orchestra, photography, and shaitel, which is the matron's wig. So since it's a question of money, what I need to know right now is, are we the parents of the bride or the groom? Privately, not long afterward, Ma recapped for me something she had read, also in a magazine, that it had been scientifically proven that certain women prefer women because they find men too powerful and threatening. And then she confided an odd bit of personal trivia that she herself, ever since she had been a young girl, would play this little trick in her mind turn a man into a woman whenever she experienced him as too uncontrollable and dominant, a practice she occasionally indulged in even to this day. How? I inquired. By imagining him in a dress, of course, silly. Even your father sometimes. It's very becoming. My mother, she was such a bandit, or as, as she would have pronounced it, bandit. Sandeep, um, when I read your book, I read it when it first came out and then I reread it before the panel. And I think for me what captures it is this idea that secrets keep the great Indian family, th I mean, alive and they, they make it thrive. I suppose the great any family. While they slowly erode and destroy the people who make up the family. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? I'm not spilling any secrets, though. Sure. This is not. Uh, Fair enough. But uh, it's true because I think the purpose, when I wrote the book, Don't Let Him Know, I wanted to write the story of a family that to all practical purposes looked like a perfectly happy family, one that we've seen often around us, you know, father, mother, son, um, you know, every good jobs, what in Bengali we call good family as one word, you know, good family. You know, comes from good family, has good job, is a good boy. Um, and 
but I wanted to show was that within that um, sort of placid surface, as it were, everyone can carry secrets, and sometimes the secrets are delicious. You know, there is a great grandmother who eats food that she's forbidden, um, which is modeled after my own great grandmother who spent her whole life driving my mother crazy by trying to eat things she was not supposed to eat. And then, so some secrets are delicious. Some secrets are maybe just like a memory that you cherish about something that had happened to your romance that nobody else remembers anymore. But you know, when you are old, older and faded, you remember that and you turn it over in your mind. And, it, and then some secrets are deeply corrosive, which is in this case one of the characters has which, where he is a man who has a secret past uh, or present with as a man who loves men, but for you know various reasons that we all know about, has gotten married to a woman, and this is this secret that he's going to carry. And what I wanted to show in the book is that when the his wife discovers the secret, she basically goes. It becomes her secret too. You know, she's un not unable to like. Oh my God, I've had the secret. Now there'll be the great exposition. But instead, there's something I've said many times before, is that in Indian families, when you come out of the closet, the entire family goes into the closet with you. So the closet becomes like an almira, and everybody with lots of room. So, you know, so that, because the whole thing becomes about don't tell this person this, don't tell this aunt. You know, I went through it in some extent on my own. So I wanted to do this, and then I just wanted to see, follow this family over the years, and see what the impact of these secrets that are not told, that are not shared, are on this very supposedly of the surface happy family. Um, talking about families with secrets and with children who identify as queer, what's the judgment done for all of us? Do you think a lot has changed? A lot's going to change? The short answer is no. The, long, the other answer is no, but the law had to change in order for all that other change to be even possible. I think, you know, at this time when we, on the euphoria of September of whatever happened when the judgment, it's sometimes difficult to remember that this fight has been going on for a long, long time, 20 years. I knew people who published in early 90s from Delhi, a tiny pink booklet called Less Than Gay, the ABVA organization. In it, there was a charter of, this was 91 or 92, there was a charter of demands, one of which included the repeal of Section 377 and gay marriage and this. And I remember my friend Siddharth was one of the people who was doing it. And I'm like, this guy's just asking for the moon, you know, like who in India in their right mind would be making all these demands? Siddharth died in 94 or 95 and but here we are it has happened and i honestly have to say that while in september in some ways it felt like inevitable that its time had come even despite what happened a couple of years ago there was a part of me that still felt like wow i was never sh entirely sure it would happen in my lifetime. I just was not sure. And so it was more emotional than I thought it would be, just symbolically having a judge. Three years ago, a, two judges of the Supreme Court said, you are, a, and it's something what you were saying, Frankie, you are a minuscule minority, a fraction, and therefore somehow undeserving of so-called rights. They use that word so-called rights for just because they thought there weren't very many of you, so you were undeserving. If, if a few years later that same Supreme Court says that you are what you are, and a judge says the community owes, is owed an apology, whether that apology comes or not, it still means something, it has to. Yes, we're dying. We're dying to listen to what you've picked to read. I am cheating, actually. I want to read a tiny little bit from my book. 
But then because it's about you know, what has happened with 377, I'll read a tiny little bit from an essay I wrote right after it happened. Sure. So in the book where I'm talking about, you know, as I mentioned, this woman has just, Ramola, has received a letter in the mail which she thinks is from her family in India. And she opens it in her excitement, not realizing the letter was not for her at all. It was for her husband. So this is just a little bit about the reaction. So it starts, the husband's name is Avinash. Dear Avinash, oh, she thought, it's for him. Maybe it's his mother. But she kept reading, greedy for news from home. And the letter goes, your wedding invitation came in the mail the other day, not even a handwritten note. I guess I should say congratulations and send you felicitations, but pardon me if I'm unable to do that. I wonder though why you never bothered to let me know. After all, with, after everything we shared, didn't you owe me at least that much? I wanted to surprise you by telling you I had finally secured admission to graduate school in the United States. I guess the surprise ended up being mine, getting your wedding invitation. I was hoping that once we were there, away from prying eyes of families, we'd be able to live the life we dreamed of during those evenings in Calcutta. Now, it tastes like dust in my mouth. I feel betrayed that you couldn't be stronger. Couldn't you have waited longer? Hadn't we promised to be together, the world be damned? Did you just think it was a phase we'd outgrow like children do with their clothes? I never asked you to tell the world. I just hoped you might wait for me. I wrote and rewrote this letter three times, wondering whether I'd ever send it. I don't really expect you to reply. Yours, Sumit. Sumit. She read the name over and over again. What kind of name was that? No one had ever mentioned a Sumit to her. That was a man's name, she said. Sumit, maybe it was meant to be Sumita. What kind of letter was this? It's some kind of joke. Outside, the rain had stopped. The sun was finally breaking through. Ramala sat at the dining table, feeling her heart slowly turn cold inside her. She held the letter up to her nose as if trying to breathe in the Calcutta air trapped inside it, as if she could unread the words. In her head, she retraced her steps down the stairs, down to the mailbox, open the mailbox, look at the pizza coupons, leaf through the furniture sale catalogs, come upon the letter from India. This time, she didn't open the letter. This time, she saw Avinash's name on it, and she just laid it down on his pile of mail. If only she didn't open it, everything could stay the same. Today was Saturday. Today, they would have pizza and watch a film. Avinash had said breakfast at Tiffany's was playing. She had wanted to see that. She really had. And on a the slightly, because it's 377, I'll just read a little bit from an essay I wrote after that. When the Supreme Court verdict came through, I suddenly remembered a man I had met while reporting on the 2014 elections in the badlands of Uttar Pradesh. He was my assigned driver, a hardcore conservative Muslim man who constantly chewed pan masala. But he would not allow me to have a beer. He would not meet, eat meat anywhere that was non-halal. He would not even eat vegetarian food in such a place. It was a stressful few days covering BJP rallies with him in tow, bristling with conspiracy theories. But finally, we relaxed around each other. I would tease him for being a teetotaler and, how do you say that, teetotaler, and listening to Honey Singh's char bottle vodka every morning. He promised me that next time I came to Lucknow, he'd take me out for tunde kebabs. On the last day, as we were driving to Varanasi, it seems to be a theme, uh, he suddenly asked, sir, do you have a girlfriend? No, I said shortly. Just to be polite, I asked if he did. The floodgates opened, and he told me a Bollywood-worthy star-crossed love story about loving a woman he had met in Quran class. They had done it all, he said to my amazement, from oral to full everything. But he didn't dare ask for her hand in marriage. He was afraid it would lead to a Romeo-Juliet bloodbath. She came from a much richer family. Her brothers, he said, had done a few murders. Instead, he gave her a silver anklet, chucked up his MBA, and became a driver to get away from it all. But now he had tears in his eyes, and he vowed that he ever came, if he ever came back, he would not let her go, even if she came back with children. Feeling I had to match up to the 
his raw honesty somehow. I looked straight ahead and slowly said, it's true I don't have a girlfriend, I have a boyfriend. For a moment there was silence. I was trying to calculate how far we were from Varanasi in case he deposited me on the highway. <laughs> then he shook his head and said, I never would have guessed. Chalo, koi to hai. See, at least you have somebody. At least you have someone in your life. That's what matters. As we said goodbye in Varanasi on the banks of the Ganga where, muddy water, where water buffaloes dozed in the muddy water, he hugged me and suddenly blurted out, you don't hurt anyone by loving someone, no? Why don't they just leave us alone? Four years later, five judges of the Indian Supreme Court pretty much said the same thing. I'm thankful I was around to hear it. Madhavi, it seems absolutely appropriate to come to you at this point because in one interview recently you said desire is never straightforward. In fact, there's nothing straight about desire at all. <laughs> we love that, don't we? And I think that sort of tells it all about your book. Why do you think I think so? Tell us. Why do we? Why, do you agree with me? Do I agree with you agreeing with me? Yes, <laughs> I do, Arpita. I agree with you when you agree with me, um, <laughs> which is great. Um, and this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's terrific. The, um, when Sandeep was reading out his piece on 377, if I just sort of maybe permitted a detour, what struck me, I'd read the piece when you wrote it as well and loved it then too, but what struck me about it is, is really what this book is about, which is um, that there are alternative traditions of thinking about sexuality and desire in India, in, and when I say India, I mean in the Indian subcontinent, that may not be recognizable according to certain narratives that we have today, but that very much get to the heart of your interaction with your driver, which is a certain understanding, a certain acceptance, a certain, let's just all get along together and get on with it. And so there's a way in which I think my book, which is non-fiction, and that does make a bit of a difference. Um, it's a non-fiction account. It has 20 short chapters, um, each of which deals with such an everyday instance or everyday interaction or everyday institution uh, that has links with desire for us. So for instance, so you know, usually when we think about desire, we think of something esoteric or untouchable or something, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and people start giggling. Um, but desire really pervades our every day. You know, from the length of our hair to how we study, to the hostels we stay in, to the languages we speak, every single aspect of our lives is associated with desire. And so one of the things I wanted to do in this book is really to think about how even when we don't think we are thinking about desire, we are. Even when we think we're not acting on the basis of desire, we are. Everything about our lives is drenched in ideas of desire that have percolated through different uh, parts of the country, parts of the world, uh, been threaded through different ideas from other realms as well, but very much affect the way in which we live. So when I say desire is never straight and straightforward, um, what I really mean is the sense of it's very hard to get a grip on desire, not because it is so unusual, but because it is so commonplace. Because we live it every single day, it's hard to sort of say, oh, this is my desire, because we actually do things differently on a daily basis, within one day, across days. Um, and so desire really can never be straight or straightforward. Um, the Shabri Mala piece, particularly, I mean, it blew my mind, I have to say, because it has such a unique take on this thing that we are constantly discussing these days. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Arpita, I must say I love all this agreeing with me business that you're, that you're doing. Why? Um, because no one else is agreeing with you not, anywhere that's else. That's not right? true. Okay, let's not but, talk about <laughs> that. <laughs> but, I mean, and obviously you're hell-bent on getting me into, into trouble. Into trouble. But that's, that's fine. Um, just sort of very briefly, I think what Arpita is referring to uh, is the entire ruckus around Shabrimala in Kerala, and you all know about this, the Supreme Court passed a judgment. The Supreme Court has been passing many wonderful judgments recently. 
passed a judgment saying that the ban on women of menstruating age entering the main shrine through the main door is unconstitutional. And so women aged between 10 and 50 who have hitherto for the last few decades not been allowed in must be allowed in. And so that verdict has given rise to huge tumult, huge uproar, huge protests, um, and all kinds of, um, you know, all kinds of sort of pressures and, and violences. So I think the piece that Arpita is referring to is a piece that I wrote um, in the Indian Express. And actually there's a chapter in my book on Ayyappan as well, uh, which was released long before this happened. So obviously I had just been sort of, uh, you know, um, pr uh, prescient about it. Um, but I wrote a piece in the Indian Express that actually, uh, you know, had trolls writing to the De commissioner of police in Delhi saying, you know, she should be arrested. Um, and in that, I talk about um, Ayyappan or the legend of Ayyappan and how I, it's interesting that Ayyappan is now being seen as this misogynistic god uh, because actually, A, he's the most sort of syncretic, accepting uh, god or one of the most in the, in the Indian pantheon, but also because he comes from a variety of stories that deal with male-male desire. And so, for instance, Ayyappan is the son, mythologically, of two men. He's the son of Shiva and Vishnu. Um, and I sort of won't go into the details of the story, but many of you might already know that Vishnu, over many, many stories, whenever the gods want him to do something for them that involves a little bit of, you know, skullduggery, he changes into Mohini. But when he changes into Mohini, no one says, oh, that's Mohini. Everyone knows that's Vishnu in drag as Mohini. And so Shiva and Mohini, Shiva and Vishnu in drag as Mohini have sex. Um, and Ayyappan is the byproduct of that, right? So he's an all-male product. His best friend, what the youngsters today would call BFF, his best friend forever is a Muslim pirate called Vavar, who he is on an absolutely intimate basis with and tells his father who's building the temple for him, you have to treat Vavar as though he was me because he and I are one. And even now when you're going to Shabrimala, you have to pray at Vavar's shrine in the mosque in Erumeli before going on to Shabrimala. So it's one of the most syncretic shrines in the country, but here too it's a male-male story. And then the last part of it is Ayyappan apparently goes to the heavens where all the gods are frolicking. Um, and he, since he's the son of Shiva and Vishnu, he's extremely powerful, right? And he says, you know, I have all this power. I want to do something really wonderful. So here's what I think we should do. Let's abolish birth. And if you abolish birth, then you can also automatically abolish death because you give birth to children because you fear you're going to die and you want someone to take your place. But if you're not going to die, you don't need to give birth. So let's abolish birth and death. And so the other gods get very scared. And you know, one of the best things about the pantheon of Hindu gods is that they're always up to some mischief or the other, right? They're always plat plotting and planning and, you know, uh, nudging each other and sort of killing one another off. And so they send um, Narad Muni, the sort of troublemaker sage, to try and stop Ayyappan because they said, my God, if we abolish birth and death, we're not going to get any revenues, right? No one's going to be praying to us. No one's going to be giving us diamond crowns and you know, money and this, that, and the other. So we've got to do something to protect our resources. So Narath goes to him and says, I have one question for you. And Ayyappan says, OK, what is it? I'm busy trying to abolish birth and death. Get on with it. And um, Narath says, I just want to know, how are you related to the wives of your two fathers? And so Ayyappan says, um, I guess Shiva's wife I'm related to, like she's my stepmother because she's my father's wife. But Vishnu as Mohini is my mother, so my mother's wife is what? Except Mohini is also Vishnu, so is that my other father's wife? And he sort of can't answer that question. And so legend has it, as he's steeped in thought, he comes back down to earth to Shabrimala where he still is, and he still hasn't come up with an answer to the question. So the reason why Ayyappan is so fascinating to me is because he actually does not deal in the realm of certainty at all. He never says to you, this is the law, this is the, law, this is the rule, and all others must stay out. And he is deeply embedded in a homosocial, homosexual perhaps, ethos um, that nobody is taking on board in this current thing, right? Because everyone wants to heterosexualize everything. So they say, Menstruating age women cannot enter Shabrimala because Ayyappan might be attracted to such women. And so my version of this is, what happens if we turn that question on its head and ask, what might it mean for Ayyappan never to be attracted to women at all? 
how might that change the way in which we look at the story? Right, so instead of a reading, you've got a storytelling session from Madhavi. <laughs> And um, I have to turn it over for questions now. Oh, so I'm being told. To well, you told a story, darling. So oh. much better. <laughs> okay. So questions. I'm sure there are many. Do I see any hands, or should I carry on asking my questions? There. I. I think I see a hand. A gloved hand. <laughs> yes, it is. Is there a hand there? Yeah. It there was a hand, yeah, okay. a gloved hand. Uh, <laughs> Hi, so my question is uh, for both Professor Menon and Sandeep, just, you know, or anyone, actually. We, we can can't you, you can't hear, hear you. you. You can't hear me? We, we can't hear you. Right. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah? yes. So when um, you asked Sandeep about, you know, uh, the progress in the 377, uh, whatever, and he said, <laughs> he gave two no's, and... That was kind of, so uh, back in our university, we had Ratna Kapoor over and she gave a talk and she vaguely mentioned how, um, you know, we, like professor said, we like to heterosexualize everything. And the queer movement is also, in a way, moving towards heterosexualizing something, the way that we want, you know, gay marriage or uh, just that we want marriage as an institution for the gays. Uh, is that why you said uh, no, uh, or uh, yeah, basically that? No, that's not why I said no, but I fully agree with you yeah. that there is the heterosexualization of the queer movement, which I think is fine if that's your choice, if that's what you, if you want to get, I think the thing about marriage is the option should be open to everybody, but that does not, but we are defeating the whole purpose of everything if now in the future the gay man feels as much pressure to get married and as much compulsion as the heterosexual woman and, did yeah. does right now right. if suddenly it becomes like oh you're gay why, beta, why have you not found a boy yet you're already 30 <laughs> years old you know your hair is receding then you know what was the point of everything we fought for but, but it is perfectly all right to fight for the right to be boring, as boring as everyone else. I think that's I, absolutely... But Sadiq, can I add something to that? Yeah. Which is, uh, could, we, could we think of it slightly differently? Can we fight not for the right to get married, but for the right to uncouple rights from marriage? Absolutely. I right? think that and is so, a much more land. That's a revenue. much, much smarter way, I think. But we seem to think that we have no options, right? We seem to think it's marriage or nothing. And frankly, to fight to get married is a waste of time, right? And why don't we fight to say everything that right now you have tied to marriage should not be tied you to You uncouple me. it to that yeah. and give it to everybody. And then let's see how many people want to get married. I think very, very few. Yeah, you don't right? get your tax benefits exactly. or whatever, all of this. Exactly. But if you're going to frankly, be pragmatic, yeah. if you're going to really be pragmatic and you really want to fight for equal rights for people, it is going to take, it is going to be a Herculean task to tell people who have power to give up what they have. And that is what heterosexual couples have with marriage. It comes with rights, it comes with the ability to be able to, you and your family, take care of someone else. So when you start telling the gay person, you are not equal and you can't have marriage, and if you want marriage, that is now somehow heterosexualizing your life, that is actually not fair because it's not the role of the person who is aggrieved, who is trying to catch up, who is trying to catch up to everybody else to now be made to feel terrible because they are demanding what is right for them. And sanctification of homosexual marriages should not be compared to heterosexualizing your relationships. There are many people who want their marriages to be legal so they can have protection. Here in your country, you already have decriminalization. In my country, we don't. Right. You know, we're looking at you and saying, you know, okay, this is one step we have to take, but ultimately, if we are going to have full equality for LGBT people around the world, there has to be no difference, and there has to be no um, inadvertent shaming of people for wanting to get married. I'll give a quick example of what you were saying. It, it happens on a practical level about uncoupling rights. You fill in an insurance form right now, life insurance, I've done this, and 
the beneficiary has to be either my child or my spouse. It cannot be my partner. And so half the time I have to fill in somebody like my mother, which seems kind of like counterintuitive for a life insurance uh, policy. <laughs> but in th this is the case where I should be able to, you know, if you decouple it from things like marriage and stuff, that I should be able to find, and it doesn't even have to be my partner, I, my life yeah. insurance beneficiary can be someone who is close to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, question, uh, um, there are, Oh, I'm being told I can only take one question. Can, we t can I take two, please? Take two oh, two together, and then they'll answer quickly. One here and one that hand I'd seen up right in the beginning. I just wanted to know what is your uh, take on this problem about identities getting confined only to sexualities or sexual orientations of a person? Or is this going to be... Uh, you know, is this going to be the norm for a while till this movement run its, runs its course and till it gets naturalized? Will that ever happen? Uh, can I take another question back there? Okay, so India has always been a land of rigid norms. So in a country where we have laws, but we don't have the correct implementation. So how do you think uh, something as gay marriage can come into implementation in a country where people are honor killed for uh, marrying someone from the same caste or from a different religion. How are we supposed to tackle with this? Uh, who wants to take the first question? Should we do the identities we question? We can do both together. <laughs> okay, both sure. Together. Um, I'll just sort of, I'm not going to answer the second part of your question. I just want to sort of add to the first part of your question. India has not always been a land of, land of rigid norms. In fact, for most of our history, we have not been. We have been a land of rigid norms for the last 250 years, which is barely a blink of the eyelid. So we have to remember that when we say we, first of all, who do we mean? And when we say we are, what, you know, and we have always been, it is absolutely not true, right? And as I sort of, as I said, when I talk about this in my 20 different chapters in this book, there are long syncretic multiple histories to which we are still heir in a lived way in this day and age, including Sandeep's driver in Uttar Pradesh, where we have a long memory of men being together and of women being together and of men cross-dressing and women cross-dressing and people having adulterous desires. We have worshipped gods who only have sex with people who are married. And so there are, you know, I'm thinking about Krishna and Radha, for instance, right? There is no question that we have been unrigid for much of our historical reality. And we've got to keep that in mind. I'll just be brief about in relation to that first question. I, I think that if we, I, I think it is a contradiction in terms to think of desire as being able to rigidify into identity. I think desire is something that we need to be able to keep open-ended because otherwise it's going to be used against us. Um, Frankie, do you want to, do you have something to say to the, se the first question which she, yeah. Perhaps I will take the, the first question. And for my purpose, I have to think about living in 2019 and the people I know around the world in 2019. Until we, as a global community, can have equality where our sexual orientation is immaterial, it is going to be imperative that those of us who can be visible about it. You know, I, I don't think that my life can be reduced to the fact that I'm a gay person, but it's not something I'm going to run away from. It's not something I'm going to be embarrassed about. And it's something that I have to stand up. So as was done in your country where they said, oh no, those people are some sort of very minuscule minority, I have to stand up and say, actually, there's one here, there's one there, and we are not a minuscule minority. And until such a point in time where we are treated as if it doesn't matter where we fall on the orientation spectrum, we have to be visible. Um, we, we have to be visible. With those words, thank you so much. Fabulous, fabulous panel. Thank you, this audience, for being so engaging. And... Um, let the fight go on, the good fight go on, and thank you very much. We wish to thank our panelists, G.K. Frankie Adosian, Madhvi Menon, Sandeep Roy, Toa Raik, Arpita Das. Thank you so much.